My name is Tim Howard, and I am one of the founders of BISH. And my guest today is Heath Smith, owner of Ruiz Salons, based out of Austin, Texas, and Heath has two locations. Um, Heath and I have been friends, and he's been somebody that I've always leaned to throughout my many years, not just in the salon business, but uh, more specifically when Vish got started, Heath has always been somebody that I look to has got such expert knowledge on our salon business, and I'm more than happy and excited to have him today as our guest panelist. Heath, nice to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. Hello. Pleasure. So Heath, do you want to just give us a little bit of background about yourself, about your business, uh, about some of the things that excite you about this topic today? Um, sure. Um, as, t as Tim said, I'm based in Austin, Texas. I have two salons uh, in the Austin market, um, the downtown urban market. So it's the the sort of luxury priced high end uh, portion portion of our city. Um, we turned 25 years uh, as a company this year, Tim. Congratulations. <laughs> Not to age you, but. <laughs> <laughs> I was only five. <laughs> Uh, so 25 years this this year and um yeah so i function i'm not i'm not from the hair part of our industry my partner and i opened uh the salon he's the 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 hairdresser operator and owner and handles all of the the marketing and uh, technical training and i've been responsible for the last 25 years for sort of the general manager role um just leading the operations team. So that's what I do. Um, and over that 25 years, I've worked really, really hard in, in our company. And then I also branch out and work with really cool companies like Vish, manufacturers, distributors. So I kind of, um, from a business standpoint, have worn a lot of different hats um, in the industry from business consultant, coach, um, uh, educator, teach seminars, speak at, um, uh, uh, business uh, workshops and et cetera. So uh, a wide array of a wide array of the ways I like to play in the industry. Um, and that's really kind of the point of why I bring it up is uh, I think when we go in dig into this conversation about data, uh, I really try and look at it from a very wide angle of why data is so important. And you'll laugh, but years ago, very my very first uh, business education in the beauty industry um, day one was about data. And the guy that was uh, facilitating the conversation, he said, no offense, but in God, we trust and everybody else, we require data. And that is no, no lie. That's day one in the beauty industry. Uh, my very first uh, business class that was covered. And it's kind of been uh, a mantra of mine is, Emotions are one thing, but when we start digging into what's really true, that's where the action and opportunity for, for change or growth comes from. So I, I love this topic. Excellent. Excellent. So we'll, what we'll do, thanks for that, Heath. That was great. What we're going to do is we're just going to run through a series of questions, um, and then you know we'll steer this all over the place. So if there's something that you want to speak of uh, specifically, Heath, by all means, just stop and, and elaborate as much as you'd like. Um, the first question that I have for you is how, how how has understanding salon data helped you reach your business goals? But I think even before you answer that one, what are some of your business goals? Because I know you know you've opened your second location. What does the next five years look like for Ruiz Salons? Yeah, you know what? I think every salon owner right now is trying to figure that out. Is it more locations? Is it scaling back? Is it tightening your belt? Uh, for us. I we've never been because we've done business in such a, um, a highly populated sector of our our city. We've not ever been one of those 5,000, 8,000 square foot uh, locations. So we've kind of always played around in the two to 3,000 square foot uh, space. So that's where I'm really looking now is what what is the new business model as it relates to space and efficiency and profitability. Um, so for us, we're st we're still trying to answer that. I'd love uh, we've got on the other side of the pandemic. We it was a really from a business perspective a really cool reset for our company. And uh, so now we've got some key pieces and and of the puzzle that we've figured out or or reinvented. And we're staged for growth. 
Now I just need to figure out what that growth what that growth will will look like in this market in this economy. So um, so yes, uh, sorry I don't have a concrete answer, but uh, definitely growth. But what that's going to look like, I think we're all trying to uh, let the the dust settle and uh, as as we figure that out. So what do you look to? What is the data? Where are you getting that from? What what are you looking at to help you make those decisions? Um, from for growth factors, I think that we've always looked for external uh, metrics. So how the, how the economy is doing, how the stock market is doing, access to funding. So if we wanted to grow, is it affordable to uh, go to a bank and get a loan? Um, those have been always the measures I think that we've, as business people, had to contend with. Now I um, post pandemic with such a, a shakeup of the workforce in all industries. Um, we're now needed to look at uh, not just can we grow, can we add another location, but can we can we staff it and can we staff it in a way that workers want to be engaged and team members want to show up and play. So uh, there's there's a there's a lot of data that we can look at that's just on the financial side of making that decision, but I do feel like from the HR side and the human factor of of our industry. There's going to be data that we're watching, uh, reports on engagement and data points around engagement, um, how the average work week has shifted. It's either how it's shortened or uh, how flexibility plays into that. So, uh, so yeah, those are those are the things that I look at. And there's no one place that you're going to find all of that um, information. You really have to put yourself out there and just filter it. And keep your eyes open, your ear ear to the ground, um, uh, both both nationally and locally. Quite honestly, and I, I think and that's really, I, I think it's really important that for everybody who's watching and listening to this, that they understand what your business model is, because we have so many different types now. We've got hybrid booth rental, uh, we've got team based pay, we've got regular commissions. So on. So where do you fall in that? Yeah, uh, employee based. So we're employee based. So um, for those of you that know the distinction in all of the different pay models, you could pay an hourly a salary structure as your compensation method. You could not have employees and you just have operators that are 1099, meaning they, they have an agreement with you. They pay you for space that they use. And, um, uh, at the end of the day, they take all the money home, uh, except what they've agreed to leave with you. So. That's a 1099 uh, arrangement, and they take care of their taxes, and they are not an employee. Um, and then on the other side, you've got employee-based, and typically employee-based falls into either a commission compensation model or an hourly or salary-based. We're commissioned. So um, for our specific market, I would say as small business, we, we fit always into the middle size range. So somewhere around 75, we've had as many as 150 employees. Um, and all of that is in two, two locations, really small um, uh, footprints. So we're quite efficient. <laughs> and part of how we can be efficient and run a really tight ship is um, by managing it through looking at the numbers. All right. And just to clarify, so because I've been to your location several times, yeah, sure. I mean, you run them like clockwork, right? So when does your first appointment show up and when does your last appointment leave? And how do you how do you manage such a big business with a big clientele and a big staff out of two to 3,000 square feet per location? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we we had a shift in 2007 and we, we went from uh, a single team, single workday shifting structure to a double shifting. And pre-pandemic, we um, were open. I'll just I'll just talk about uh, the business hours, et cetera, in um, uh, for one location. But we were open uh, seven days a week, and five of those days we were open from seven a.m. to ten p.m. and Post-pandemic, with, again, as the attitude, attitudes towards work and uh, uh, 
flexibility and a little bit more autonomy. We've since shifted our hours. We've been we've done that very responsibly, and we'll talk about that in a little bit around how you make those decisions using data. But um, uh, we've changed our uh, our uh, hours of operation. So now we're open until 8.30 p.m., but 7 a.m. to 8.30 p.m., and we're able to run uh, one and a half, sometimes two different shifts in a single business day. Um, so yeah, they're, they're run pretty efficiently. And when we have two different technical teams, we also have two different support teams. So if you use assistants or interns uh, or juniors to support uh, double and triple booking, you'd have two, two sets of those teams and two desk teams if you have a, a team of uh, guest care that support the check-in and the checkout process. So yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of complexity. But the payoffs when you get the formula right is that you can maximize efficiency to a place that you're producing essentially two profitability uh, streams in, in one space, if that makes sense. Total sense, it does. And are your hairdressers, are they dualist or are they single focus? So you have a cutting team and a color team, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're uh, specialized. So generalist or specialist is how how we talk about it. Um, and listen, for those for those that are trying to figure out which model works best for you, I think you have to look in your market and see uh, what is considered normal. If generalization is the way customers believe a salon experience should be, and uh, hairdressers feel that that's how they should. Uh, come to work and practice their craft, then it's probably generalization is is uh, the method for you. We believed very early on, I mean, we opened in 1998 and looking at all of the market leaders across the entire United States, um, all of those salons that we put on a pedestal were running in a specialization format. And then if you go to any uh, beauty show or advanced training, You've got haircutting at the same time hair color is happening. So you have to decide when you reach a certain level uh, of in uh, in the industry and how you want to play and approach your work. You do eventually have to have to decide. So we've just leaned into that. Um, so for 25 years we've we've been specialized. So we have a haircutting team and a hair color team, and it allows us to really uh, channel resources to those uh, individual uh, specialties so that we can raise the level of performance for them because they go to work and then they, fo they focus their training and they focus their work on cutting hair, cutting and styling hair or color and chemical. And it's been a great formula for us, works really well. Yeah, yeah. well, you've got a very talented team, they're well-trained. And I think it's important that we touch on that as well. Um, you know, if we're talking about data, we're, we're talking, let's look at your retention with your staff. Mm -hmm. So what is the acceptable rate? Right. Where do you know that you're doing things wrong based on the data you're receiving about your, your staff retention? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. And how do you adjust that? And what do you do to retain staff? And two parts to that question. What do you do to attract staff? Where are you pulling from? Um, I know you and I have talked outside of these, you know, formal conversations. You and I have talked about, um, you know, the quality of students coming out of school, how the pandemic has affected schools and how it affects future hairdressers uh, who may not have got that training. So I know that's pretty broad, but yeah. uh, retention of your staff, how Why do you not? Want to Yeah, let me, let me maybe start and you kind of steer it uh, from there. So um, if, you, if you talk to industry experts and then go outside of the beauty industry and you talk to any HR um, experts. And if there are KPIs, which are key performance, uh, key performance indicators or benchmarks or metrics, whatever you want to call them, uh, essentially what the people that do it best are your high performers uh, company-wise, we'd like for staff turnover to be below 20%. So 20% of your team can churn or turn over in a year. Um, if you have more than 20%, that is cause for concern. If you have less than 20%, doesn't mean that you're out of the woods because in that 20%, you could have some really high performers that fell into that group. <laughs> so, um, so you have to take each, I think this is another lesson that I've learned over the years. You've got to take each, uh, uh, each metric or data point that you're looking at and take it for face value and then ask yourself, 
what do I know now? And if you still don't know the whole picture, maybe you've got to add a second metric or a second data point or a third until you get uh, a clear picture as things start gelling for you to really be able to have enough information to be actionable. So um, I'll tell you, Tim, ours 20% or less. Um, and in 2020 and 2022, I mean, 20, 2020 and 2021, we've been way above um, the 20% turnover mark. Um, and mainly that was due to uh, hairdressers in training because Austin's such a great place that everyone wants to move. Uh, so a lot of those people that went to beauty school and moved here for an advanced training program to start their career, they said, mm, got to go back to my family where it's safe and I've got a free place to live to weather this, uh, weather this storm called a pandemic. Uh, and then also uh, anyone that was uh, client facing, so your front desk team, uh, my HR uh, team, anyone that uh, was the first person to interact with customers on a daily basis, um, they got really nervous during the pandemic. So there's lots of turnover in those roles as well. Um, but it has since stabilized. I don't know uh, for your listeners out there. I felt in 2021, 20, uh, kind of at the end of summer, I started, it was like this imaginary line we passed going into August and September, and it, it started to feel more um, familiar with how we were able to do business, seeing client patterns return to normal, seeing timing standards with your team returning to normal. It started to feel that familiar rhythm, and last year, last year was great. So 2022, better uh, attrition um, with, with team, but yeah, definitely during normal times, you don't want to be turning over more than 20% of your team in a year. And what do you attribute to it? Like, I mean, I know there's so many factors to it, but what are some of your successes? I mean, you have such a handle on the data, you have such a handle on running your business, right? You, you obviously, your day-to-day, -day, you have a good team that's behind you to help you with this. But for smaller salons or for salons that, that aren't, don't necessarily have the same management staff that you have or right. experience that you have, what are some key things that, that you think are important for them to monitor and to do in order to attract and retain their staff? Well, I, that's a really great question. And it's, there's, a, there's a lot in there to unpack. I, I would tell you, listen to your team. If you've ever asked your team why they work there, you know what they're going to say? Because of the clients. And then next, they'll say, because of my team. So if you look at the, the motivators for our team members and, and where they find satisfaction, it's doing a great job and doing it with people I like. So I'm not, I've never been on the bandwagon of saying, oh, my team, we're a family. F families are dysfunctional. I hope I could run a business that's way better than a dysfunctional family. Um, so I don't like to call my team members family because at the end of the day, there's a value exchange. They come to work, they trade their time and we give them a paycheck, but it doesn't have to feel that way. So uh, I would say management strategy and how I approach team uh, that helps us retain, um, retain employees is, and I think you're hearing this loud and clear with today's workforce is everyone's unique. Yes, you make your rules, you create your, you create your processes and your structure of how you'll employ people, your job descriptions and what their jobs are. Make your rules, but you're going to break your rules every time you're dealing with an individual because everyone wants to be seen um, in how they can show up. And so you'll, you'll have the basic guidelines of how you employ people, but don't be afraid to pivot and dance on both sides of that line. Uh, to bring that employment relationship to life, because everybody, everyone needs something different. Um, and if you've if you've been managing uh, team members for for a long time, you really understand that um, retention of them happens in that magic where you're talking to them one on one, and you ask them, "What would it take for you to work for this to work out here? What do you need in this relationship to feel successful?" Okay, well, this is what I need. So it's it's a 
it's a negotiation and every time you're you're um in interfacing with a team member you have to figure out what what they need at that moment and you got to try and find a way to get as close as you can sometimes you'll do it and sometimes you don't um but it's always a sad and if this is the other part if you don't feel um if you don't feel a little bit of a a pang of regret or loss when you you lose a team member you got to lean more into the relationship side of it i'm not saying make yourself super vulnerable that right. you're a basket case as people come in and and leave and leave that's just part of our job people are going to come in and people are going to leave but um whoever's doing your hiring for you if it's if it's the the founder the owner or whatever you picked your team you right. picked every single one of them. So it should matter to you. These employment decisions should matter to you. So uh, Tim, I, I think that's what I would just say is the kind of the magics in the meet people where they can show up, individuals, one person at a time. And I think if you play in that space, you'll you'll retain. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Now, now let's let's switch it over to the client. So let's look at data on clients, client acquisition, average ticket class, client retention. So what are you doing to monitor that? What reports are you looking at? Just, just kind of give me that scope of, of how you focus on your client acquisition and your clients in general. Yeah, so basically when you think about um, data, the uh, we do a lot of work in with initiatives and projects, especially marketing, and we don't put the right uh, mechanisms in place to be able to track it. And number one rule that I always work with um, around marketing is if you can't track it, you can't change it. So every time we spend money, we've got to be able to measure whether there's a discount code or uh, use this code when booking or when we apply a discount. Um, there's maybe another line item instead of, instead of a code that's added to the ticket. Uh, we've got to be able to create as much transparency in where we're spending our money around client acquisition as we can. So, uh, some of the some of the things that I like definitely unique uh, discount codes in most point of sale softwares. Um, that's trackable, and you could see, you know, I have forty eight redemptions of this discount code. Um, if you if you have a marketing initiative that you can't really apply a discount code, it's really did this person come in or not come in. You can uh, either choose a certain booking method so that they're flagged by the way that you booked them on the appointment book, or you could actually add, let's say they had uh, a highlight and they had a haircut. On that same ticket, you could add another line item that says uh, charity gala event. And that would then be another uh, thing that gets rung up that would link them back to a specific marketing event. So kind of in, in the absence of a real clear, easy way to measure, if you can't get a report for everything, then create your own. Don't be afraid to step out of, uh, out of bounds and create some manual tracking that, that would kind of fill in the gaps. But if you can't track it, you can't change it. You don't know if your money is being well spent, then then you could just keep throwing cash at it, uh, hoping you get customers. You talked about uh, client acquisition. One of the most effective is internal referral programs. So getting your stylists that have great clients to send in more people just like them. So if you've got good customers, just ask your customers, who else should come see us? Who else do you know that would enjoy, um, uh, enjoy an experience with us? And we found that by tracking that, it's the cheapest, lowest cost uh, return on investment to get new clients to come in. I think and we actually we actually just did that. We spent um, a thousand dollars on an internal program rewarding our hairdressing team, and we had over two hundred new clients come in during that period of time. So, so if you invest, what was the investment on your end? A thousand dollars. So just walk me through that. What does that look like? How, how did you set it up? How did you promote it? And how did you track it? Well, um, number one, if you're going to ask, or if you're going to reward customers, you also need to find a way to reward your team that's engaging the customers to give you the behavior that you want. So essentially, 
it's a two-sided coin. If you're giving a discount or incentive for your client base, you better have something in place for your team. Otherwise, they're going to just not be motivated to play along. So if you're giving uh, if you're giving an existing client an incentive to send in their friend, their sister, their their neighbor, yeah, they will get a discount if they send that new person into you. And then the person coming in, there's got to be an incentive for them. So you're taking care of them for uh, going out on a limb and trying a new business. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is some of those referral programs that stop there fall flat, meaning there's only so far they'll go. And once you figure out that you left out one of the key pieces, which is your team member that has to drive it from their chair or has to drive it from the front desk, if you bring them to the table and also give them something that would motivate the, the right behavior so that they would focus on it client by client by client, then you start to see uh, better results. So we just set a, a cash prize. We set a cash prize. We had a first place, a second place, and a third place prize. And all um, a hairdresser had to do over that period of time was to get 15 referrals redeemed, meaning whoever they handed cards to, 15 new clients made it back into the business because of that referral program. And once they got to 15, they were eligible to win either first place, second place, third place. And we just we just reconciled it. We had um, uh, a first place tie. So we just split the prize between the two. So they each got $500. And guys, for doing nothing, all they, all they did is hand out a card the client that they handed it to was either motivated by the incentive, meaning I like free product. So they were either motivated by that or they were motivated by relationship, right. which sounds like, yeah, Tim, I'll hand this out for you. I like you. I've been coming to you for 10 years. Why wouldn't I do that for you? So it's not a lot of extra work. It's just the action. These small actions all roll up to create, um, I mean, in this case, 200 new clients. Now, What's the value of a client worth? Is it ten thousand dollars? Is it thirty thousand dollars? Is it fifty thousand? I don't know. Like my business would be different than yours, but it yeah. <laughs> for a thousand dollar investment, it was an amazing return. And so, what did you do? So, is that through your salon? Is it through your POS that you track this? So, you had a referral call. Was it tracked to the POS, or do you use outside software? Yeah. Um, so that's a really great example of, um, I don't want to go into too big of the detail, but it's an example of the the limitations of probably most POS systems. They can only take it so far. So um, if you have a referral program and you're trying to create a tracking, well, you could track it by discount code means the client comes in, the brand new client comes in and they get their $20 off or their $30 off. Um, it would track that as a referral. Um, but who is the most effective person in your business that could hand out the most cards and get the most responses? A lot of people would say, well, your juniors, the ones that have the most space are the ones that could get them or or should get the, the most access to the most clients. And, and that's true. They have the most space. But the people that should be handing out the cards are your seniors and masters that have access to the most customers. They're yeah. seeing the most people in a day. So we had to create a workaround uh, years ago because we were tracking based off of discount code, meaning the stylist that did the service for the brand new client was getting credit for the referral redemption. Meanwhile, I've got super busy colorists handing out these cards left and right, but they have no room on their Jeez. own column. So the clients are being triggered to call in. Oh, I can't see Melissa. Well, who else can I see? So that's where we had to create a backup tracking system. We couldn't rely just on the discount code. So we had to that we had to, to come up with a backup that would capture the person, the stylist that actually did the referring. And that's visible on the, the paper card. Um, or the digital card, whatever uh, format you're using. And that's where we went ahead and just added another line item on the ticket that says, thank you for your referral. And it uh, lists the initials of the stylist that actually did the referring. 
Okay, so let's pivot from that for a moment. And I want to talk specifically about color, color usage and color reporting. So what metrics are you looking for? What are you, what are you tracking from your color department? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I will say that when you think about where you're getting your data, that's a really important, <laughs> important uh a question you need to be asking yourself is what data are you looking at, but where are you getting it? And so um, it's one of the reasons we partnered with Vish and have Vish in our system in our in our salons and in use because we know they're set up to report out on color data, color data per service, color data uh, per per colorist. So we're really confident in, in the information we're getting from from Vish. So so Tim, yeah, you're. Your software, the Vish software, is going to be our number one uh, place that we get um, data on performance of uh, of color in our business. Um, mainly waste. We look at waste a lot. We look at um, the reway behaviors. So our 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 technicians completing that cycle uh, of mixing color and then reweighing at the end. Both of those metrics are super important. And a few years ago, we took actually when we sit down uh, on a monthly basis and do our one on ones, we took the Vish rewake percentage for each person that used the scale structure. We took it into their one on ones, and now it's a metric that we coach against um, because it's a behavior. Are you are you being responsible for the for the investment of hair color that we're giving you access to? Um, so the reway percentage is one, um, and the other one which. Before, Tim, you guys created this company and gave us all of this really great information, we used to have to track color purchases against color sales. Um, and I still look at that. Right. I still look at how much color we write a, a check for every year to our distributor or our manufacturers. And I compare it against the the color service dollars. And um, I still look at that number because I think it's very, very important to be mindful of what you're giving these distributors and, and uh, manufacturers. We spend a lot of money. It's one of our largest expense categories. Um, and, and you want to be able to roll it up and understand how much you're really spending to provide color services in your, in your industry. I mean, in your business. Um, you know, and then the other metric that I like to look at is um, the dollars we generate on average per color guest. Okay. And I look at that because that's a number that will vary from location to location. We're talking about pricing standards and timing standards, but it really is a number we will always want to see grow because we want to know that our color business is becoming more and more valuable as a service category. So we want to see that what guests are spending with us over time is increasing. So those and, are my three that I like to look at. And how do you do, how, where are those increases coming from? Is it from add-on services? Is it just from more detailed, more, you know, more color services? So where is that extra spend coming from? Yeah, um, the, definitely add-on, but if you, this is a little bit of a crazy um, way to think about uh, and Tim knows me, so I'm a, a analytic kind of an analytic leaning brain. Um, so what I like to look at on an annual basis is our color business, and I look at it from uh, colorist to colorist. So just because you have, let's say, 15 or 20 color services on your service menu doesn't mean that every colorist is selling all of those services or even recommending them. So one of the things that I like to look at is where is the bulk of our color business? So for an annual report, I will run how many partial foils, how many full foils, how many balayage, how many ombre. And I look at that for the entire location as a percentage of total color services. And I could say, I just did it for 2022. And I could say, oh, wow, look at that. Basic highlighting rec represents 52% of our color business. That's an important number to know. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you look at each colorist one by one by one, if you know that overall, <clears throat> excuse me, the 
basic highlighting represents that large a chunk of your color business. If you get to a colorist that's doing 75% gray coverage, wow, there's an opportunity here because I guarantee you there's a clientele sitting right there that's being influenced by that colorist that probably would also like some highlighting services. Then you could also look at colorist by colorist by colorist, which services they're really recommending. And this is an example of not being explicit information, it's implicit information. But if you see that you have a, a colorist that never recommends advanced techniques like balayage, hair painting, or ombre, that's an opportunity to coach them because I guarantee you that they have a clientele that probably would be open to it. And that's a place where more dollars live. So I like to look at um, from a clientele, I flip it backward to the technician because they have their own patterns that they're in. When they get to a consultation, they reach for the same services. And we know this is true because um, you can you can see really popular, busy colorists, a lot of their clients look just like them. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> and why? It's because that's what they do well, but yeah. it doesn't have to be the end of the story. You could get them to branch out and offer more. And that kind of leads to your question is, yeah, in add-ons. So what are all of the, what are all the ways we could help each client that comes in? Sometimes it is a basic highlighting. But sometimes it's adding that to some gray coverage, and sometimes it's adding that with some face framing, and sometimes it's taking them away from highlighting to um, a fashion color. So ask all of the questions. It really starts in, in the consultation. And if you see the that you have stylists with the bulk of their color services are two or three services, that's a huge opportunity for you to coach them to broaden what they're recommending because I guarantee their clientele is dying for variety. Yeah. It's absolutely. just an opportunity for growth. And I imagine then that's an opportunity so you understand where the education is needed as well, right? If you're looking to bring in an educator or if you're looking to do some internal classes where the gaps are in your service menu. That's that's great advice and great insight. Um what about hair color inventory? So one of the questions, sorry, you, you spoke a few minutes ago and you talked about, you know, a color inventory versus color sales, color service dollars. I interact with salons all the time and they tell me that they have, uh, you know, their, their budget is 10% or 12% of their sales. And often I try to get them to unpack that so that they're looking just at the color data and the color spend. So what is what you just spoke on for? I see that all the time. Um, how 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 do you budget for your color department on a reorder? Is it a percentage of hair color sales? What do you, what do you do for budgeting and and re restocking, replenishing your hair color inventory? Yeah. Um, gosh, over the I've seen people do it so many so many uh, ways, and um, bless you if you could ever get. <laughs> the formula right. <laughs> um, I will tell you um, the approach that I've always had because I came from a retail industry very early in my career um, is you basically what we sold or what we used is what we reorder. Right. Now we know that people are making these decisions. So you'll have someone, Vish could give you a list of order, you know, these 68 color SKUs. And a person is going to say, oh, well, it's almost spring break. We're going to be going into blonde season. So I'm not going to order, even though Vish says to do that, I'm not going to order this. I'm going to, there's going to be a natural uh, adjustment and tweaking every time someone in your company orders. So what I found, Tim, that is the most successful is to decide what I want that budget to be. And it would be a percent of last weeks or the last two weeks or the last four weeks of color sales. Right. And that's the percentage that I'm uh, allowing on a order by order basis as a budget. So you can look just at color sales or you could look at total sales. 
Uh, the people probably that are placing your orders and are responsible for the budget would probably love for you to just lump all of the services together and then they can figure out how to spend because there are times when they need to maybe bump up their color inventory and they need right. the leeway to, to spend dollars however they want. But I'm a big stickler of that. So I'll tell you, um, again, pre-pandemic, we were ordering hair color one time a month. That was it because we could look at four weeks of hair color sales and we could apply our budget formula and we would always have the right amount of product in stock. Um, so we are now ordering it on a weekly basis um, and we're about to go back to two weeks and then we'll be back to four weeks by the end of 2023. But it's a very simple math. We, we give our team four and a half percent is the budget for all back bar compared to services for the prior week. Okay. So they run their sales report, figure out how much we did in uh, total services. Some things you need to pull out like extensions, they, they will skew your numbers really um, crazily. So you're really just looking at core services, put those in, figure out what the dollar amount is, multiply it times four and a half percent, which by the way, is a super aggressive lean budget uh, percent. A lot of businesses use seven or eight percent. I've just been doing this so long that uh, the efficiency is there. So we multiply it times four and a half percent. And then that is the amount of dollars that the team placing the orders can spend for that week. Um, and it, it works really well for us. And just to clarify, sorry to interrupt you. That it, are you saying of just hair color sales or are you saying total service sales? Total services. Total services. Okay. Um, and your your price point is much higher, right? So do you mm -hmm. I mean obviously it's easier because you have a higher price point to get in within your budget? Um, but why do you do that versus separating out your color business and just ordering off of that? Because we know the cost of haircuts are so much, they're only, you know, what do they cost a dollar to service that haircut uh, on back bar supplies? And then of course you have to weigh out what is your hair color percentage of hair color to hair cutting services. I know that right. <laughs> all over the place question. Uh, so let's replace that. <laughs> but listen, that's a really good question. So let me tell you, um, when we did that, because that was exactly, again, my analytic leaning brain was to pull out the non-color services and just focus on, on the color services. Um, once we drilled it down to that point, it really didn't save us um, that many steps, leaving it all looped, lumped together. We were able to use that budget and take care of um, uh, both service categories. Now, we'll say if you if you have spa, please do this separately for your spa numbers. Um, pull out hair. Definitely pull out hair and look yeah. at it separately. Um, but we found that uh, doing that four and a half percent for total service sales for hair gave us ample amount of money to spend towards color and back bar for both cutting and color. We were fine. And how, how did you establish these benchmarks in the salon? So is it just trial and error? Like you said, some salons do seven or eight percent. How did you, was it a long progression to get there? And how did you establish the benchmarks? Yeah, the what I would say you need to look at multiple years of data, and you're looking at reach for your PL for a 12 month period of time and do that for two to three, maybe four years. And we started seeing a trend in our uh, overall back bar as a percent of total services. We were hitting below five percent consistently, um, and so that was that was where we pulled that number from. Uh, I just went, knowing I was going to talk to you guys, I went back and did the old formula, uh, which was the amount of color I purchased compared to the total uh, uh, color dollars that we produced. Uh, right. And it was somewhere around 6%. Okay. So um, we're purchasing about 6% of what we're actually producing in color services. So if I'd kept using my old formula, I'd be overspending. I'd be investing too much, <laughs> too much money into into color. So um, I kind of like it, uh, the formula that I'm using. And are you doing it right? 
you'll know if you if you are controlling all of the factors that you can control and the same people are consistently placing the order using your formula checking in your order using your process and it works if people can reach for product hair color tubes and it's there you're doing it right um you really in most cases have the ability to just order enough for a week reorder you get replenished really quickly um so you'll know that it's working if you have very few emergencies and what ends up happening is you get a couple of really squeaky wheels and you get a couple of really dramatic emergencies in the salon where you're out of bleach or you know color catalyst or something and the knee-jerk reaction is the next time we order we overspend by hundreds of dollars oh. and then it tends to be permission to do that so that mm -hmm. you know we don't have a an emergency next week the person has a little ptsd and and this is how spending gets out of control yeah yeah absolutely okay um i'm gonna just so on that topic um for those of you we've just released the fish rewind so which is an in-depth deep dive into the color business and it's available from our website getfish.com and uh it again it's called fish rewind so i just want to put that out there that little plug um okay so i've got two more questions for you heath okay uh, what are the three most important data points to evaluate and run a successful business? I know that's a really big question, and it's uh, you may take a moment to think about that. Super easy. Yeah, super easy. <laughs> What's that? No, I think it's super easy. I think um, uh, in, in a service business, well, again, uh, being from a um, the retail industry, there's a metric that we've always we always used in um, measuring success, and it's uh, annual revenue per square foot. And I think it is an easy metric that should apply to the beauty industry and service industries as well. So it's essentially your total dollars that you produce in a year divided by your number of square feet, and that will give you uh, a production number, a dollar per square foot that your business generates annually per square foot. And the people that do it the best are over a thousand square feet. If you if you want to be kind of falling in the middle of the pack, you're somewhere between four or five, six hundred dollars per square foot annually. That's one important metric that I can reach for and know whether my business is growing or not. Um, a second one is frequency of visit for clients. So how often are your clients coming in and taking advantage or purchasing your services? That number is super important um, so that you understand whether all of the systems that retain customers are firing just in the right way. If they are, clients can't get enough of you. We A secondary number that falls in that is rebooking or, um, or pre-booking. Uh, and then in its simplest form, I think client volume is number of, number of clients on your schedule per day per week, per month, and we look at that on a company basis. Um, how many people, unique customer visits do we actually have in a day, in a week, in a month? Um, and that's a metric that I feel like for a service business, if you could just keep the, the flow of customers coming in and you're refining all of this stuff using really great data points, it's magic at that point. Fantastic. That's a great answer. Thank you. Okay, so the final question, or oh, can last I say, one. yeah, can I say one thing? Someone's okay. probably going to say, "Why didn't you say profitability?" And I'll tell you because I believe that if you're nailing those other three, profits happening. That's a great point. That's a great addition to that. Thank you. So, okay, never mind. I'm going to spin off another direction by question. <laughs> um, okay. So what are your top tips for a salon owner who, who feels stuck or lost? when it comes to data and evaluating numbers. And there's a second part to that, is that you have, you know, you've got a long history, you've been in business 25 years, as you've stated. Um, 
What about the salon owners that may not have the resources that you do? Salon owners that don't have, maybe they're behind the chair still and they plan to stay behind the chair or they don't, maybe they're an eight chair salon and they don't have the management team that would allow them to look at the data as you have. What tips do you have for those salon owners and that type of salon owner? Yeah, well, for if you're that type of salon owner, I mean, just because there are much bigger businesses than yours out there, come they comes with those businesses come with a lot bigger problems and complexity. <laughs> so <laughs> the grass is not always greener on the other side. So um, I would say if you if you're in a place of you know you want to get started and you want to track some data points and um, try and grow your business using some structure like that, just start small. Start small. Pick one to two data point that you want to create change around. Um, the other thing is ask again, and I mentioned this earlier, where are you getting your data from? Is this going to be from your P&L, from your accounting software? Are you getting this data point from your point of sale software that you're using in your salon? If you're using a data point that you're getting from your point of sales software, please get on the phone and ask them, can you tell me how you're calculating this number? Because right. a lot of those uh, point of sale systems, they'll use either client visits or client tickets or appointments on an appointment book. A lot of the, the, the software companies are using different ways to calculate a data point and they're all calling it the same thing. So make sure you know where the formula is being calculated from. Um, and then ask yourself, is that enough information for me to create change? And what I mean by that is years ago, someone, someone said um, numbers are indicators of behaviors. Well, if I'm looking at a number or a metric, a KPI, and I don't like that number, let's just say it's new clients coming in my business. If I don't feel like that's enough new clients, that's telling me something about the behavior that's happening in my business, which is we're not focused on acquiring new clients. So that should spin you into another direction of how can we be focused on acquiring new clients? And the question, how will I know if that behavior has shifted in my environment? And you may have to create a, a second or a third set of behaviors that you want to look at. So is it a referral card? Are referral cards being handed out in your business? Are um, your stylists posting before and afters on Instagram? Those are two very simple things that you could do with not a lot of bandwidth or a full leadership team that is just asking for a different behavior from your team that would give you new clients. Um, the last part of that is you just got to make it trackable. Whether you, you ask your team when you post a before and after, please just take a screenshot, shoot it over to me in a text. Or send it to blah, blah at the front desk and they'll post it and pin it on the back uh, wall. If you do things like that, you're creating, even a very loose way, you're creating a structure that is trackable and measurable. And then you could say, wow, guys, we got you know 30 new clients this past uh, month, but look at that. We had 18 before and afters that were posted in the same month. You guys see the connection here. Um, so make sure that you understand the data points that you're pulling from your software. Vish is gonna be amazing for, for hair color data, but if you're trusting your POS system, make sure you figure out where those data points are coming from and then ask yourself if that's enough information. And if it's not, don't be afraid to create your own manual tracking. Um, again, I'll just go back to, you know, if you can't track it, you can't change it. So you're dealing with people, you're dealing with behaviors. You've just got to have enough transparency to know if the behaviors that you want happening are actually happening. That was perfect. Thank you so much, Heath. That is, I, I knew this would be, you'd be the perfect candidate for this topic. Um, and then in terms of the POS, how much does the, what drives you looking at the POS company that you're going to use? What, what are the main drivers? Is it the reporting that is most important to you? Or is it the marketing piece? What is it? Oof. 
look at you. Um, <laughs> and we're not mentioning who you're using or, you know, we're not trying to. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you've got to remember the hat that I wear. So I would tell you always it's the, it's from the operations perspective. If they've got robust reporting and tracking um, capabilities uh, so that I can understand my business, because let's, let's just use that example, a chair salon, I'm behind the chair one more day than all my hairdressers. So I don't have the bandwidth to see this. So it means that whatever choice you make with your POS system has got to be super informative. You've got to be able to put your hands on data and do it fast so that um, you can make decisions quickly and efficiency in your efficiently in your business. Um, roll it up to a two or three or five or six location company. We have the same needs. Right. We have the same needs. So I think operationally, um, they've got to have really, really good reporting that's dependable um, so that you can understand the behaviors that are happening in your business through the perspective of each employee and each customer ticket or interaction you really want to understand um that and and now i think that the tide is turning in salon pos systems where they're realizing that we need to be able to engage customers from a marketing perspective just like your dentist just like your doctor just like your ortho i mean your orthodontist or your whatever uh I say this jokingly, but my pet groomer does a better job of engaging customers than a lot of POS systems. Like the texting ability, the text reminders, you're overdue for your next visit. This is the kind of stuff I think that um, there are a handful of POS systems that have figured this out and they're really leaning into that. So right now for where we're doing business, I think the name of the game is attention. And who can help me maintain the attention of my customers? That's that's where I'm looking at. Um, it is an it is a, a version of operations and another dose marketing. Uh, and I think the POS systems are are playing catch up, trying to figure out how to do that just the right way. Um, I told you one of my metrics that I believe is the most important is frequency of visit. And um, it is a challenge getting that data from a lot of POS systems. There just hasn't been a focus on the service side of our service business. How often clients come in, what are they purchasing from us um, in a capacity that we could actually work with that data and get them to buy more deeply, buy more broadly, use, you know, book more of the services that we offer so that we have customers, not just for life, but for all of their service needs. That's what we want. We want them spending with us as deeply and broadly as we can. But if we don't have great reporting that helps us understand um, those client behaviors and reporting that would help us change those behaviors, then we're just kind of stuck. And, but, and lastly, Tim, I would say there's some, what I find is there's really great POS systems out there. I just like a little of this one, a little of this one, a little of this one. Um, so, they represent the personality and the influence of the de of the developer and the founder. Um, and the old school way, they the, those systems used to be developed by distributors and manufacturers, so they were all product focused. Um, now I now I see a trend, a swing that they're focused on the service side of our business as well, and that'd be really helpful. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Heath. It's always a pleasure. You're always such a wealth of knowledge. And uh, I, can't, I can't say how much I appreciate having your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, go to getfish.com. Look for our Vish Rewind 2022 data report. Super valuable, deep dive into hair color metrics. A lot of the topics we spoke of today will give you some insight into help run your color business. Again, go to getfish.com. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great night.